Hey everyone, first I wanted to thank you for this. It's my 100,000 subscriber play button. And honestly, I am just really thankful that you're getting so much out of this channel. So it's kind of fitting we're talking to one of my favorite YouTubers today, Van Neistat. He created, back in the day, an HBO show called The Neistat Brothers with his brother Casey Neistat. And it was one of the first things to show us what internet video really was supposed to be all about. Thanks to the work of Van Neistat showing the way, there's not going to be a mainstream anymore. A million creators will bloom, one click at a time. Let's get into it. Van, I'm such a big fan of your channel. It's like really a treat for you to just hang out with me here. So thank you for coming on my channel. Oh, my pleasure. The honor is mine. Uh, the reason why we're here talking is sort of because you got an iMac back in, I don't know when, like w when did the iMac come out even? Like 98 or something, 97? It came out in 98 and then the iMac DV, which was the first iMac with iMovie, came out in 2000. And so I got it like the month that it came out. I, I believe that's correct. So yeah, I think that that's one of the things that we can sort of trace even just people doing YouTube um, in this sort of style that you do and your brother has done. Basically, the modern vlog sort of came out of your work and the work of your brothers. I know, you know, I think that our ambition was always to go into the cinema. At first, it was just this hobby. You know, I got the machine so that I could edit the family VHS tapes that my mother had shot with the VHS camera from like 1985 till I think maybe 93 when I went to college. But that's what started it. And then I just kept like shooting stuff. I was living in Brooklyn, you know, from the country. So New York was just endless as far as like extraordinary phenomena was concerned. So I just started making all these movies on a quest to be, I, you know, I didn't, it wasn't a conscious career thing. Because it was impossible, you know, this technology was so new, it was almost like a toy. So there was no career in making internet videos. So I think something about our generation that's maybe, I, don't, I think it's a, I think in today is a disadvantage is that all of these paradigms that have been relatively permanent for like 10 years, YouTube, you know, Final Cut Pro, the SD card based video cameras. There were five or 10 different paradigms that we were dealing and learning and coping with just to get to the one that has been standardized for you know maybe a decade or so. And so a lot of my like education and learning was, was figuring out all that stuff, was self-teaching all that stuff and having to have a job and like paying the expenses. So he has some pretty rent. cool jobs. I did have, I've had great jobs. Yeah, that's true. I mean, one of my favorite episodes of yours was uh, detailing, I think you were in Europe at the time and you were uh, sort of fixing that art in installation and um, what that taught you about, I mean, just making. And that's a big part of your channel and your, you know, even day to day today, sort of the spirited man being the, the builder, the creator, the, you know, problem solver. Yeah, that was, I worked for Tom Sachs in New York. He was building this gigantic installation called Nutsies. And we were building model, like one of the things we built was the world's largest model of a, this Le Corbusier building called the Unité de Habitation. And so in building that installation, I was sort of the handyman because I kind of had my hands in all the different layers of this project. I was chosen to go to Europe to be the caretaker for this installation because it was always broken. I was at the Guggenheim in Berlin for four months and there was a repair station there where I had kept all the tools in my desk to fix all the different elements of the, of the installation. And then my friends started bringing in stuff that was broken and then the general public started bringing in stuff that was broken, purses. Uh, one person brought in a couch. I think one of my friends brought in a couch that needed new feet and the the guard was like, is this okay? And I was like, yeah, sure. It's participatory art, like the original form of it. You know, the Bob Ross painter, did you watch that documentary? I haven't yet, but it's on my list. It looks amazing. He says that um, talent is pursued interest. And I think the guys that are the most, the guys and gals that are the most successful are the ones who start very young 
and they just keep, they will themselves into the thing that they're very interested in. And for me, I don't know. I, I just have never really been good enough at something. I always, I think I had this perception that natural, that the way you were supposed to figure out your vocation was just what is the thing that you have an advantage of as far as natural ability is concerned, because that was the story. That's the narrative that I was always told. But, you know, I talked to a friend of mine who's just sold his third pharmaceutical company. He's my age. He's like two months older than me. And we've known each other for 35 years. And um, he said, you know, the people like Mark Zuckerberg, these guys that become billionaires at, at 27, he said, you just have to throw them out of the data pool because most of us have to grind and maybe we get a breakthrough, you know, in our mid forties or something. My brother, Casey, he was very young, but he started young with everything. He started young and his back was against the wall. He had a baby when he was like 17. So as an like, outsider, I mean, watching the two of you interact, I mean, I think that he also had you. So, well, thank you. <laughs> that's mm. what kind of <laughs> that's, I mean, yeah. yeah, I don't want to presume, but I, that's like, that's the interesting thing about YouTube is that like you and I might not hang out that often or ever, right? We've never met in person before, but like, because I watch your videos, you're sort of a character in my brain and like, you know, vice versa. And it's like so interesting how that works actually. And like, I know about you through Casey and I've met Casey in person, but but yeah, it's, you know, me knowing, hey, like he actually really, he actually was deeply influenced by you. Seeing what he made inspired me to start doing YouTube, actually. So it was a common story, but. And then what I realized was uh, there's like stuff that I want people to know about. And mm. um, there's like, a, and then I'm sort of a nerd that I love the technical end of making this stuff. So kind of like how editing got you into ultimately film and things like, you know, making documentaries. I feel like the mechanical act of creation got me into making videos too. You know, it's like the craft of making films is infinitely deep. And I think that was one of the cool things about what you've done and what Casey did was like, let's bring the craft of making into something that hasn't seen that craft. Like the internet didn't have this idea of having scenes and acts and uh, like there's a story every single day. That was like incredibly aggressive to to bring that level of it's quality. It's astonishing that he did that, that he was able to do that. Like I keep trying to like have these very low threshold for ambition videos where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make this in one day. It's really simple. I'm just gonna do this, this. And I, I've only been able to do it, like I've made for this channel, I've made like maybe 50 videos. I think I've only been able to do it twice. And I'm not even sure that I was able to do it. I think maybe I just, I, I was only able to shoot it in one day. And then it took me another day to edit. The production value of like his pace of cutting like every two seconds, is there something new, something new, something new? That's very difficult to do. That's a lot of like labor and work. You know, people say that it, it seems new to them, this thing that, I, that my videos and uh, I wonder if it's that, if like, because YouTubers are generally young, they haven't had 20 years of writing and failures and, 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 and reading and learning about the fundamentals of storytelling. And then, of course, there are some YouTubers that are brilliant structural storytellers as well. And I think that traditionally the film and television, those industries get the, get the real like fundamental guys and gals that's where they go you know my peers you know josh safty and ben safty and ariel shulman and henry juice these people are i mean they were just so they had such great craft they had such great point of view such great yeah. storytelling and writing um, yeah josh and benny safty went on to make uh, uncut gems which is like legend at this yeah. point I met Josh, I think he was maybe 21 or 22 years old. He was at, I think his last year of film school at Boston University. And his films back then, he made this movie called, it's this film that he shot on 16 millimeter film called Going to the Zoo. From then you just kind of, you just knew like, oh, these guys are going to, I mean, they're just, they're cinema guys, yeah. they're doing it. So when you look at something like Uncut Gems, I guess what you, what I'm hearing is, you know, that kind of thing, you see the end result, but it's actually sort of 
decades even of like honing the craft and doing it. And I think what's interesting is your relative, like you got to more than four or 500,000 subs very fast, which is congrats and awesome. And like, not a surprise at all to me. And that, but you, before doing YouTube or deciding to commit to YouTube in the past year, you know, you, you made the documentary and you like went deep on the cinema route. And then now you sort of see both paths. Like, what do you think is going to happen? You know, is it a parallel thing? Like this weekly content grind is very different, but also lets you exercise your skills, like in a much more direct way. (laughs) I think I'm going to continue with this for a while, for, for years. And like, Gary, it really is a matter of like livelihood. Like I'm really trying to get you know, I'm trying to, it's really hard to make money in this racket. You know, I'm starting to put together Patreon tiers and and explore the idea because I think that that paradigm is a really smart thing. It's, it's, I think it's really cool. I think it's a a kind of revolutionary. And um, a lot of my audience members have been recommending it from like very early on. They, oh, we want to give you money. You should have a Patreon. You should have a Patreon. We want to some scribe with money and do you know this comedian tim dylan oh yeah yeah totally yeah i think i've seen him on some of the interviews and he's really funny his videos on youtube get demonetized all the time because he just doesn't care (laughs) he just talks about all the forbidden stuff and he's just hilarious you know in researching to consider doing a patreon page i looked on his um his patreon actually joined at the lowest tier and his is public and the day i joined it was he was subscriptions he was making a hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars a month and then three days later i went to like listen to some more podcasts and he was making a hundred and seventy thousand yeah, dollars awesome. a month and that's it's a new me, renaissance that's that's real money and i feel and just the beauty of like the fans going directly to the actual person you know like that is that's how it's to be yeah, it's fantastic. We, we, we were the first investors in, uh, or one of the first investors in Patreon, actually. So, are you kidding me? Yeah. So, Jack, you know, Jack Conti and Sam uh, Yam, uh, we met them when they just quit their jobs and started working on it. Jack was still working. You know, he he still has his band, but he was, you know, just looking at the view count and was like, there are millions of people who watch this video. But then you look down at like the ad. AdWords money and you're like, oh, it's like 20 bucks or something, you know? Yeah. Ugh. It was a real present problem. And then, you know, he happened to start working with his college roommate. That's when we met him and it sort of just grew from there. So it, it's just really cool to see that happen. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of yours. So it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm one of your set subscribers and we're just, you know, getting started really. Do you think that'll work? I think it'll work for me. I yeah, think my no timing's question. really good. Well, everyone watching right now needs to go, you know, after if they watch all the way to the end on this video, then they yeah. click to the description and watch Vans. Yeah. Well, I don't have it up subscribe. yet. It's, it's, it's not up yet. Oh, oh, my YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah subscribe. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but so That's I right. just... I, I supported you on the Kickstarter, which was like the first part. And then, I mean, I think one of the ideas for Patreon was like, there were creators and artists making things for Kickstarter, but then Kickstarter forces you to be on a treadmill of like, you have to make this, you know, like project by project by project. Kickstarter sort of showed that you could crowdfund and then Patreon was, well, what do creators really need? Well, they really just need a patron, right? There should be a new sort of patronage and that's what's happening. And then that's the cool thing is um, time was, there's a sort of system that you have to be a part of, whether it's like the cinema you have to pay your dues into cinema for like 10, 20 years. And then now there's this alternative thing that like anyone could just pick up a camera. And if you make good stuff that people want to see, here it is, like the creator economy, which is kind of cool. There's also something that is, uh, you know, that we don't, I don't know that we do talk about very much about YouTube is that it is a new genre. It is a new film genre. You know, Casey and I are two of the pioneers of it. And we weren't making you know, traditional cinema and then showing it on YouTube. A lot of that happened when all this stuff came out. Like I remember when the um, Canon XL1 came out, this like red, white, and black video camera that shot on mini DV tapes. I had one. 
And like the thing that was getting attention was that, oh, people were taking this camera and making feature films with it. Yeah, it's You know, awesome. or Final Cut, oh, we're making feature films with it. But what we did was we, we were making, I, you know, I don't, we were making things that designed for internet use. So they had to be a certain duration so that you could upload and download. And then we got that HBO show and it was sort of, um, it was like they were taking internet stuff and putting it on broadcast. What I like now also is like how, uh, I guess one of the interesting things that I, I've found about your channel is like, it looks like you can just basically pick up the camera and just start talking about whatever is on your mind. So when like Afghanistan and the fall of Afghanistan happened, for instance, I, you know, was really moved by the video you put together with your neighbor. I, I, I guess part of it is like, it was such a compelling like way to tell the story, right? And you're like, here's a question mark. And then, but anyway, I'll link to that in the description too. Cause it's just like, so what I'm trying to say is like, that was a really cool episode. Like when something was happening and you wanted people to do something about it, you could do it. And you got hundreds of thousands of people to put it in their brain. It, like it definitely affected me. And it put me on a whole like tangent where I was reading a lot more about what was happening in Afghanistan when normally like, you know, if you hadn't done that, maybe I wouldn't have looked at it. I had originally wanted to appeal to like to, to influencers and just be like, look, call senators, call congressmen. Cause it's something we all agreed on. The issue was like, we wanted to get our helpers out of Afghanistan, these interpreters that the Taliban was just going to go and murder. I mean, they had lists of people, they were just going to kill them and their families and they are doing that. And so I was just thinking about one thing that these influencers haven't really done that I know of is use their incredibly powerful political power there's there's so much power with these people who have 100 million you know subscribers or so 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 forth and i just i don't know i just thought might as well give it a shot yeah you know i, I don't know i put a lot of it's i hope it looks really easy i hope it looks like i just pick up a camera and start talking but man it's a lot of effort a lot of writing a lot of drafts and like one of the things I'd like to do with the uh, Patreon is at a certain, um, you know, tier, I'd like to have all the paperwork, you know, do the episode, the video, and then you will have access to the paperwork, which is like PDFs of stuff like this. This is like what I'm That's working on. That's one of on. your scripts? This is today's. Yeah, this is the one. It's it looks so show. effortless, but it makes sense to me. Like, it, you know, if you watch, you're like, oh, there's... There's some editing magic in here to like oh, good. make it feel very seamless, right? I mean, the more effortless it looks, the less effortless it actually is. Yeah, I think that the trick with I mean, the, the best editing you shouldn't notice at all. It should just be it, you should just be there. Have you changed the way you edit from you know, what you would do in your cinema days to now? So the year of like leading up to COVID, I wrote a screenplay. I would get up at four in the morning and from till about seven or eight in the morning, I would work on this screenplay. I had the masterclass suite, which was, you know, it's all of the master classes, And I listened to each, every writer and all of the filmmakers. And I'll basically said the same thing, which was the, the writing is the king and you have to just sit down and it sucks for everybody. And it's like super hard for everybody. And it takes three hours and you don't really get anything until hour three. David Mamet put it, the greatest. He said, my biggest fear in life is that the audience is going to beat me to the punchline. Mm -hmm. So what you're building is essentially, it's the structure of a joke, your, your, your movie or your video, you know, you've got to have it be entertaining, entertaining, entertaining. And then in a film you have two didn't see that comings. Right. And then in the end, it's like the, the big ironic realization that the character goes through that. Like it was, he says it's both surprising and inevitable. And that's what you're trying to find. And so you got to go through it as the writer. And it comes this like breakthrough, this piece of irony or this twist. It, it, it just comes from a tremendous amount that's of work and you don't really will it. I mean, it's yeah. like, it's a reward for the, the labor or something. Yeah. I find myself sometimes like, I guess, like revealing too much about myself actually which is also an interesting thing that happens. You know, one example would be, you know, I have talked a lot, a lot on my channel about um, my struggles, just like how hard my childhood was. And even now, like 
through therapy, it's like, shoot, you know, I'm still unpacking that stuff, actually. But I guess for that, I, I just want people to know, like, actually, that's somewhat normal or can be normal. And if someone is watching this and feels that way, it's like, hey, don't feel weird. Like, I felt weird and I didn't get help for a long time and it actually hurt my career and, like, made me rage quit and do all these, like, crazy things that, you know, almost killed my career many times over. Oh so, yeah, you rage quit. You don't come across me as someone who <laughs> well, you I seem build, very cool. I build to it me. up. I build it up. I build it up, and then <laughs> that's the interesting thing. So, Whoa. but you know, I, what, for, for that stuff, I'm like, I want people to know just because. But that's actually like the real me. Like, shoot, you know, I, I know. Like, people always say I feel very uh, zen, but I'm like, oh man, if you were in here, like, mm. <laughs> it's like it's not that zen, man. <laughs> But that's real subject object type, how, what a creator has to go through today. Right. And that you have like a little bit of separation. Cause like there's a persona that you choose in, in a lot of your videos. It's a, for me, it seems very simple, but for me, it was a gigantic innovation to have it be like this third person thing where it's like this spirited man, like, and that's just like, it's just an I love archetype. It. I love the sound design. I love the intro. Like, I, and then I, now I realize like it's something that I think your subs like probably just get addicted to because it's like, oh, every week I want to hear that like I want to hear that bird and I want to hear like the typewriter. And as long as I'm making it, I think that's another thing that all these masters say is you just really got to keep going and keep making it, and it always feels it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like I just keep my eyes on the numbers and uh, how many views and all of that. And that's really what I'm trying to do and build the numbers. And I know people don't want to hear that. They want to hear that like, oh, we're just artists suffering in our garrets and, and you know, uh, we do it for the blah, blah, blah. And we do it for this and we do it for that. And it's like, well, yeah, I've been doing it for that. But like the numbers are what give you the resources and the opportunities to, to keep it going, to keep the damn train going. It's looked down upon. I, I don't know. Maybe it's not looked down upon. Maybe, it, you know, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, there's that the whole sellout thing and there's the this, but. I guess for me that, you know, in startup land, there's definitely that aspect of um, too much money ruins everything. Like, mm. you know, I was just. But for example, can you give me an example? Yeah, I don't know. I have a friend. I don't want to like say what startup it was, but I just hung out with him. He's old, old friend. Like we started companies together 10 years ago. Basically, like the company raised like a crazy, you know, eight, nine figures amount of money. And it like, what? wait a second. Company. What is eight figures? Is that hundreds of millions? It, like tens, tens to hundreds of millions. I mean, you know, that's how oh much these God. startups raise now is like tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, right? <laughs> So the whole ecosystem has grown like by 10x and it is like 10x more money. Uh, and then basically what happens with a lot of these companies is uh, sometimes they turn out to be Theranos, which is insane, right? They're just never going to make it like completely too far over their skis, too much BS. Yeah, they, that, that's like too much money in a nutshell. If you give too much money to the wrong people, it's like it'll never work. And it doesn't matter like how much money there is they will not be able to hire good engineers and keep them. And so too much money ruins things all the time. But I imagine like on the cinema side, like you say the same thing about, you know, the average, you know, nine digit budget, like hundred million, two hundred million dollar blockbuster. I mean, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. But what what happened with your friend that you that oh, he was just, just like about? super pissed, you know? He was just mad that um, you know, they hired the wrong people. It got crazy political. I, I imagine it's not that different than any other place where there's too much money and too much power and a lot of people sort of fighting over it. Money like really ruins creativity and like doing the right thing. I wonder where the sweet spot is because in the seventies, the artists kind of wrestled control and they made the best movies. That yeah. That sounded will, awesome. Maybe the, that will ever be made. And it's, I, it was also a very strange time because it was the time of the the least amount of wealth disparity in American history. But my point is that why they are so amazing is because lots and lots of money were given to the right people. I don't know. It's kind of sad. Cinema is um, 
I think American cinema is suffering now, but I don't know. I'm kind of out of it. I haven't really been paying attention to it. Yeah, I wonder what happens from here. I mean, it seems like there's some pretty cool things still being made. But, yeah, uh, but it's mostly those series on Netflix. Yeah, Or that's the streaming right. series that are like, and maybe that is what cinema is now, these gigantic storylines. It's key. Yeah, the key now is to be a showrunner, I guess. And then you get a lot more content for, uh, and maybe that's why it's better, right? Because you get a lot more time for the crews to actually gel and the stories to gel. And then, yeah, I mean, on the flip side, like everything's become much more chopped down to the level of like, yeah, five to 20 minute YouTube videos, basically the stuff that you make. Oh yeah, that's right. There is. Everything's chopped down to their, that hand, level there's now. Little, and then on the other hand, there's gigantic. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. My ambition's weird because like right now I'm just trying to keep up and get the numbers up. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, you're the the key thing here. I think is the algorithm just shows your videos no matter what if people watch and they watch. So I think the score takes care of itself from here. I mean, and that's cool. I I just like that that uh, once you have invested enough into YouTube, it's like YouTube just gets you in front of people, and then that's sort of yours for as long as you want it. Actually. Another thing about it that's really amazing is that it's as if I have a weekly magazine column or newspaper column. Did you ever, are you old enough to remember 60 Minutes with Andy yeah, of Rooney? Course. At yeah, the yeah, end? of course. Yeah. So it's like, that's, that's your thing. Like, you know, I got one of those things too now, which is kind of sweet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, I'm but definitely yeah, the- obsessed with it. Like Vox, for, like Vox Explained, for instance. I have a friend who's a producer with Vox and they had me on like the, if you go on Coding Explained on Netflix, you can, well, I'm like one of the guests in there. And, but that's also what turned me on to like, oh yeah, nonfiction, you can put together something that teaches people a lot. I mean, one thing that was a really big influence for me back in growing up actually was like PBS documentaries, Frontline and things like that. I mean, even just the tone and like, I learned a lot about how the world works just from, from that. And that's like, going on super strong, like whether it's Vox Explained or, you know, I love Ashley Vance uh, at Bloomberg. He's the guy who wrote the uh, the book on Elon Musk. And um, he has a great, one of my favorite shows about China, tech in China, for instance, on Shenzhen. He has an episode called Hello World um, Shenzhen. And it's like, you're there with him, like learning how all of our electronics get built in like this place that most people never get to see. It's like literally the Silicon Valley of China. I don't know. It's like you get to learn about the world in like 20 minute chunks. And uh, and I'm like, I think it's the golden age for that, actually. I mean, you could say Vice News was total outsiders coming in and remaking the news channel in sort of your vein, in Casey's vein, in like new, new way to cover and talk about news and how the world actually works. It's amazing to me that people are interested in the YouTube stuff that I'm making because it's like, I can't figure out even what it is, but I think maybe what it is, is like my, an ambition that began maybe 10 years ago for me, or maybe a little more is that it's like Mr. Rogers for adults. Dig it. He, he went away and then where were, there was, there was nothing. And it's something that we all had in common. I mean, that's extraordinary. You know, whether you're Barack Obama or a guy in prison, like, we had everybody watch that that show. I mean, the other thing is it's so direct, right? Someone sitting green lighting stories or ideas probably wouldn't green light most of the stuff that gets millions of views. And then that that's like the really big change uh, is that now what you get to see isn't for music. It's like not payola anymore. It's at what people actually click on to listen to. And then same thing for videos. Mm. Yeah, and I think something's going to happen yeah. and it's going to get wrestled away and somebody's going to conglomerate and they're going to figure out how to, I, I think, I, I don't know. Do you think I'm wrong? What do you think? Or is it going to just be more disintegrated? I think the long tail is like longer than ever. And that's a really good thing. But then the I cool know. thing is I think maybe, you know, going back to, you know, mainstream or lots of money is not cool. Like now it's disconnected. So you know, actually what's, what Patreon allows people to do is like, you could be 
nobody's mainstream anymore. And in fact, you don't have to be mainstream. And then not only that, you can find your audience and your niche no matter what. And then, then there's money there. And then that's not, not only that, that's actually cool money to have. Cause it's like, it means that there's a lot of people who like would not get to hear about this thing any other way. Yeah. And it's like, they're buying the t-shirts and the lot. It's almost like they're buying tickets. Yeah. It's almost like live. Like I'm also thinking about, I'd like to do an event, live events somehow. Oh yeah, dude. You just got to do it. People would totally show up, show up with an, like a live audience. Oh yeah, definitely. You know? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of possibilities. I'm really excited about the Patreon thing. It's like, yeah, it's funny that it came out of, it came out of what was lacking in Kickstarter. Is that a fair way to categorize it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are creators who are just like, I have to, you know, in order to eat on this, I need to make a project every month. And that's a lot of work. So should there be a way to just, you know, support creators regularly? And yeah. it's like, yeah, you know, that, that company is going to be a public company. It's wild. When, when do you think that's going to happen? Oh, sometime in the next couple of years. That's the rumor anyway. Okay. Wow. So you, are you still invested in it? Are you allowed to talk yeah, yeah, about it? Yeah, just hold on. Yeah, no. I mean, we're like super big fans. It's like, hold that forever, man. <laughs> like, it's going to be super, super valuable company. It's so cool that there's these weird, like, capitalist, these these models that, like, like, like Kickstarter that I don't think that they fit the capitalist models. They're like surprise outlier phenomena. I mean, I think that's why the internet's so cool. It's that um, the classic thing... You know, going back to what we were talking about with movies, for instance, film cost a lot of money and, you know, doing sound right cost a lot of money. And then the biggest cost was like, how do you get distribution into theaters? And it was all like, you had to like get, you know, <laughs> you basically the studios had to pay money to these people and they paid these money to other people. Yeah. And it was a cartel over like people's eyeballs. And that, that cartel is gone now. It was obliterated. And then in its place is like, infinity video on the internet for like every type of person at every generation for like every thing that they might be into. It's, 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 it's pretty miraculous. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much for hanging out. I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours and hours and <laughs> maybe we need oh, to do it again. Oh, my pleasure. All right. That's fantastic. It's fantastic talking to you. And I really want to dig into your story. I'm looking forward to talking to you again. And thank you so much for supporting me on Kickstarter. Dude, thank you for making amazing videos for us to watch every single week. So everyone watching right now, thanks for making it all the way to the end. And then click the link in the description now. Click subscribe on Van's awesome channel. You're not going to regret it. Mm -hmm.